With the Neolithic Revolution complete, agriculture, writing and currency had become cornerstones of life across the Middle East. As the wheel of time continued to turn, mankind pursued ever greater heights. A new age was dawning, the age of civilization. Of all man's innovations, perhaps none thus far were more impactful than the discovery of bronze. It had previously been discovered that copper ore could be smelted into pure copper, but when combined with small amounts of tin, bronze could be fashioned on a large scale. From there, two civilizations grew rapidly during the end of the 4th millennium BC. Egypt along the Nile River and Sumer along the Euphrates and Tigris rivers. Despite these parallels, the two civilizations differed in both their origins and current form. Of the two, Sumer was the oldest. Eridu, the oldest city in the world, had been founded around 5400 BC, and by 3000 BC, many large cities existed in the lower Mesopotamian plain. Each city exercised political independence and competed for hegemony over Sumer. Conversely, in Egypt, the cities were much more recent. Migration to Egypt during the 4th millennium BC due to the drying of the Sahara caused the population to expand in dozens of cities along the Nile. By 3300 BC, these cities had been united under two kingdoms, Lower Egypt and Upper Egypt. Around 3150 BC, these two kingdoms were united under one monarchy, founding the first dynasty of Egypt. By this time, a complex mythology had been constructed around the concepts of Ma'at, or harmony, and Heka, or energy. The Egyptian creation story held that there was initially nothing but Nu, the eternal sea. From this sea rose a hill and the god Atum in the presence of Heka. Atum created Shu and Tefnut, the god and goddess of air and moisture. From these deities came the earth, Nut, and sky, Geb. Most other deities came from Nut and Geb before they were separated by Atum. Egyptian life was accordingly governed by the principles of Ma'at and Heka. Acts of the individual had an effect on Ma'at, and so it was in the Egyptians' interest to behave with morality in mind. Heka, by contrast, can be seen as an energy that gave meaning to reality. It was an all-pervading force that allowed Egyptians to interact with the universe and other gods. Sumerian mythology, on the other hand, initially made less of a distinction between man and gods. Beings not entirely human or god ruled over earth. It was said that An, the highest of the beings, believed they were overwhelmed with the amount of work required in order to make earth habitable, and they created man as separate from themselves as a result. The Sumerians were initially highly polytheistic and may have believed in as many as 3,600 deities. Over time, however, the religious structure began to reflect on the political reality of Sumer. A patron deity was assigned to each major city, who would act as the city's protector. Examples include the god of rain and irrigation, Ninurta, who guarded the city of Lagash, and the goddess of love and war, Inanna, who guarded the city of Uruk. With this complex mythology rooted into Egyptian society and no major foreign threats, Egypt prospered. The dynasty that united Egypt finally met its demise around the year 2890 BC, when the second dynasty of Egypt usurped the throne. Peace was largely maintained during this time, and the use of bronze spread. The need to record information also gave rise to the new writing system, called the hieroglyphic script. It would remain in use in Egypt for over 3000 years. The second dynasty ruled for about 200 years, and fell to the third dynasty in 2686 BC. This dynasty relocated the capital to Memphis from Tinis, which brought about the first of the three golden ages in ancient Egypt. The annual flooding of the Nile River plain allowed for vast agricultural surpluses, which in turn freed up a significant part of the workforce for other jobs. The most well known of these are the pyramids. The earliest pyramid, the Pyramid of Djoser, was completed around 2630 BC. It was followed by the Great Pyramids, which were built during the fourth dynasty. Meanwhile in Sumer, the situation was very different. 
the leading cities were in almost constant conflict for supremacy, and so, unlike Egyptian cities, they built large defensive walls to deter enemy armies. This made any outright conquest and occupation of cities difficult, and so from around 2900 BC, during a period called the Early Dynastic Period, one city would hold kingship or hegemony over Sumer. Sumerian mythology claimed the kingship existed in various cities for over 200,000 years before a great flood, but the first historically verifiable kingship was held at the city of Kish. It remained here until around 2650 BC, when it was taken to Europe. Various other cities held the kingship after this, but over time the power of the leading cities grew, which was first realized during the 25th century BC. The cities of Yuma and Lagash fell out following a border dispute. The two fought each other in the earliest recorded battle in history. It was a decisive victory for Lagash, and over the next few years it conquered Larsa, Uruk and Kish. This dynasty is perhaps best remembered for the code of Urukagina, the oldest known legal system on earth. The supremacy of Lagash was however short-lived. Yuma later regained its independence under King Lugal Saxi. He conquered Lagash during the 24th century BC and united Sumer under Yuma. He relocated the capital of his kingdom to Uruk around 2355 BC, founding the third dynasty of Uruk. Sumer was now united under a native dynasty, but it was not to last. The collapse of Kish in the north allowed the city of Akkad to fall out of the sphere of Sumerian control. Its first ruler, Sargon, was a highly expansionist king. In 2334 BC, he marched south to the capital of Sumer, Uruk, and captured the king, Lugal Sakasi, in the ensuing battle. Around 2318 BC, Sargon conquered Mari, a long-established kingdom in the west. After defeating the Elamite kingdom in the east, he became supreme ruler of Mesopotamia, from the Mediterranean in the west to the Persian Gulf in the east. This is usually considered to be the world's first true empire, which precipitated the spread of Akkadian culture and language across the region. Contact between Mesopotamia and Egypt grew during this time. This was due to the need for large amount of bronze to fuel the Akkadian and Egyptian empires, and open huge trade routes across the Middle East. Although still prospering, Egypt had changed since the early days of the Old Kingdom. The sun god, Ra, was now at the pinnacle of Egyptian life. The pharaoh was seen as his protector on earth, and as the people depended on the sun to sustain their livelihoods, the pharaoh's position was decisively strengthened. Accordingly, there was a marked shift away from the pyramid construction and towards the construction of sun temples during the 5th dynasty, which continued into the 6th dynasty. These building projects were so extensive, in fact, that they consumed most of Egypt's spare labor capacity. But underneath the surface of this splendor and excess, trouble was brewing. During the unusually long reign of Pepi II, internal rivalry set in, and upon his death in 2184 BC, the situation rapidly deteriorated. The Seventh Dynasty initially exercised loose control over Egypt, but a long drought and famine during the 22nd century BC caused the political unity to fracture. By the time the Eighth Dynasty had taken power in the capital around 2160 BC, centralized power had collapsed. A rival dynasty, the Ninth Dynasty, was proclaimed in Lower Egypt, and another, the Eleventh Dynasty, in Thebes. Further famine and general discord continued for the remainder of the century. The Akkadian Empire too faced increased difficulties as time went on. Two weaker rulers followed the death of Sargon, allowing much of the western portion of the empire to gain independence. The fourth king, Naram Sin, who was Sargon's grandson, kept the empire together under his comparatively strong rule between 2254 and 2218 BC. But imperial decline was seemingly inevitable after his death as Akkadian rule was restricted only to the area around Akkad. The final blow to the empire came as Gushans from the Sagros mountains descended upon Sumer and Akkad. As the Gushans had little understanding of how agriculture worked, a great famine occurred. Unlike Egypt, this famine was primarily due to inefficient use of fields and caused the price of grain to inflate many times above its normal value. Yet in just a few decades, both civilizations would reunite the 8th dynasty of Egypt collapsed around 2118 BC, which allowed Upper Egypt to reunite under the rule of the Theban kings. A later pharaoh, Intef II, began to make claims to Lower Egypt, 
which brought him into conflict with the Heracleopolitan kingdom to the north. The conflict went on until 2055 BC when Pharaoh Mantuhotep II was victorious over Heracleopolis and reunited Egypt, thus beginning the Middle Kingdom. Similarly, the Gushan dynasty of Sumer was unable to hold on to power. Various cities gradually declared independence during the end of the 22nd century BC. Most notable among these was Ur, which gained independence in 2113 BC and quickly went about uniting Sumer and destroying the Gushan dynasty. Its king, ur set about creating an empire equal in size to that of Sargon's some two centuries earlier and conquered the symbolically significant city of Mari around 2105 BC. Marriage alliances with kingdoms in Syria secured control over the west by 2030 BC. Mesopotamia was reunified for the second time. As a means to legitimize his rule in newly conquered territories, ur issued a new code of law. This code highlighted many of the societal norms of the time, as well as the empire's social structure. The peace and prosperity that ensued during ur rule allowed Sumer to recover from the turbulent times of the Gushan dynasty and was the first time Sumer was ruled by a native since the third dynasty of Uruk. For these reasons, this period is often viewed as the renaissance for Sumer. For Egypt and Sumer, the third millennium BC was a time of both explosive growth and crippling decline. They had experienced the opulence of what civilization had to offer and the disastrous consequences of its collapse. For better or worse, civilization had now been set in motion and there was no turning back.